Great. Thank you very much, Tamash. And thanks to all of you for being here. I would thank all of the organizers, but they're not all here at the moment. So I'll thank the organizers as represented by Tamash. Okay, so this is joint work with Nada Tvetkovic and Tim Conrad at FU Berlin. Um, without further ado, let me talk about the objects that I'm interested in, and they are metastable diffusion processes. So what are metastable diffusion processes? They're basically a class of random dynamical systems whose trajectories have three important features that I'm interested in. So first of all, the process spends a long time in almost stable, or what I call metastable, subsets. So on the x-axis, you have discrete time measured in units of delta t. It goes from 1 to about 300,000 time steps. And on the y-axis, you have the state. So this dynamical system lives on the circle as represented by minus 180 degrees to 180 degrees. Some important features are that we have small or rapid fluctuations inside the metastable set. So within this band, which I denote by A, about from minus 120 to minus 30 degrees, that's one metastable set. And there's another metastable set from about 40 to 120. So we have these rapid small fluctuations. But we also have large slow fluctuations. And by slow, I mean we have to wait a long time to observe such a transition or a fluctuation. For example, a transition from A to B or from B to A. Here's another example of a metastable diffusion process, except that the state space is now two-dimensional. So this is the product of the circle with itself. And here you can already imagine that some of the questions we might ask are, let's suppose we're in this metastable set. Or for, more, for a more interesting example, let's suppose we're here. How do we get from this metastable set to this metastable set? And you can imagine there are many ways to do this, and the simplest, naive, you know, just law of large numbers might not give you a, such a structured way of analyzing these transition paths. So the problem that I want to ask is as follows. We want to analyze transition paths of metastable diffusion processes in a structured way. And the question is, if I give you two metastable sets A and B, how do I analyze the time series data of such transition paths in a rigorous and principled way? The relevance of this question is as follows. In some cases, maybe in some of the cases that you've seen already, time series analysis offers you pretty much the most practical way to study a dynamical system of interest. For example, if the system is too complex to study on pen and paper, but you can simulate it easily, as we've seen in some of these models, time series analysis is one possible way. The constraint that we place upon ourselves for this method is that we want our approach to have a rigorous theoretical and statistical foundation. The foundation of our method is transition path theory, what I will refer to as TPT. Key assumptions of this theory are that the system is ergodic, it's time independent, which is a constraint, I know, but for simplicity we'll start with this. The state space is finite dimensional and the dynamics are described by an SDE. The main objects and ideas of this method, or this theory, I'm sorry, are that we want to focus on trajectories of a random system that leaves some metastable set A and enters another metastable set B before re-entering A. So these are called reactive trajectories. And we've seen an example of this already yesterday in Freddy Boucher's talk where he spoke about committer functions, the probability of hitting B before going back to A. Now, a fundamental principle in a lot of mathematics is if you take a whole bunch of random samples of something and then you average over that, you obtain a deterministic object which is somehow smoother than your original rough random objects. And that's precisely what we are going to do. We're going to take all our random reactive trajectories, average them, and obtain something called a deterministic streamline. This streamline turns out to be an integral curve of a vector field that we will call the probability current. Just to diagrammatically represent what I mean, so let's say we have a metastable set A and another B, and we initialize all our random tra trajectories from some point Z0 on the boundary of A, and we launch an ensemble of reactive trajectories until they hit B. If we take all of this, this whole ensemble and average, ideally we get something smooth. And this streamline here, this smooth streamline, somehow represents the average behavior of what these trajectories do. What's on average the most likely way to go from this point A to, bit, to hit B? So the definition of the streamline can be done in two ways. We can either formulate it as the solution to an initial value problem with a driving vector field given by this vector field J A to B. Right? and with a prescribed initial condition, and we evolve it until it hits B. Equivalently, we can rewrite this as an integral form. Okay? We just initialize and we just follow the vector field. How do we define this driving vector field J A to B? Well, this is one of the cornerstones of transition path theory. 
we define the probability current to be a vector field, Rd to Rd, such that for any sufficiently regular set S that's not in the union of A or B, the metastable sets of interest, we have the following equation. So basically here, N delt S is the outer unit normal to this set S, and sigma sub del S is just a surface measure on the boundary of S. So on the left-hand side, basically you have the outward flux of trajectories, or sorry, the outward flux of reactiveness through or across the boundary of the set S. And on the right-hand side, you can tell by the limit of, basically, you have an ergodic average here. It's a long time average. And what we're doing is that we're basically counting. So this first term counts every time the system at time t is in the set S, and then tau units of time later, it's outside S. So we count such transitions, and we deduct opposite transitions, and then we take the limit as tau goes to zero. So it's an infinitesimal transition across the boundary. Basically, we're doing a net count of trajectories across exiting S. The question is, how do we compute this object now? We have a definition for the probability current. How do we compute it? This brings me to the method proper. So the step one of, step one of our method is to basically discretize. Anytime you want to compute something numerically, you have to discretize it because that's just how computers work. And we discretize state space using polyhedral partitions. Take, a part, take your state space, discretize it into polytopes, and now choose a polytope S from this partition. Let's denote the adjacent polytopes by SK and the facets by FK. So because of this, we can decompose the boundary of our polytope S as the union of these facets. And this allows us to decompose this surface integral into the sum of integrals over the facets. Because we're dealing with diffusion processes here, and because diffusion processes have almost, continuous, almost surely continuous paths, we can do precisely the same trick as we did for the probability current, and just rewrite this integral on the facet as an ergodic average. So basically, we still have the same interpretation. We're either computing the flux or the net count of transitions across the kth facet. And the key idea now that what makes this whole thing possible is that we can approximate this right-hand side using time series data. A consequence of our choice of polyhedral partition is that we can simplify things. So you recall that in the surface integral term, we had the outer unit normal, and we also had the surface measure. Because we're working with polytopes, the outer unit normal is just constant. So here you see a polytope S, and this is a facet. The green arrow is just the outer unit normal, and it's constant no matter what point you choose on this facet, right? And correspondingly, the surface measure on this facet is just d minus one dimensional Lebesgue measure. So that's particularly easy to work with. The second point is now we want to approximate our probability current. You recall that the probability current is what defines the streamlines, and the streamlines give us an average description of the transition paths that we're interested in. So now let's choose a polytope S, and let's suppose that there exists a vector, a constant vector J tilde, such that for sufficiently small s, we can approximate our probability current by this constant vector. Then, if we define alpha k to be this facet integral that we saw earlier, we can just approximate this thing as the weighted, as the surface volume weighted dot product of the outer unit normal with this vector that we want, right? And recall that alpha k can be approximated using time series data. Now we define a tall and thin skinny matrix, capital N, with capital K rows, where capital K is the number of adjacent face facets to this polytope. And each K, the kth row of this matrix is basically this row vector here. Given this definition, we can then stack the alpha Ks into a vector alpha, and we get a matrix vector equation. For reasons of linear algebra and uh, computational, or rather discrete geometry, I'm going to instead solve this system of linear equations, because it's easier and it's nicer to analyze. Then I basically repeat this entire procedure that I did for one polytope for all of the polytopes in the polyhedral partition. This brings me to the first rigorous result in this method. Okay? So the method, this step so far was basically how do we approximate the probability current, the driving vector field. Let's assume that we have a bounded state space, the diffusion process is ergodic and stationary and has an invariant measure mu and in particular that the probability current is globally Lipschitz. I'm going to sweep a lot of the statistical computations under the carpet because it just will make everything messy. So for simplicity and for convenience, I'm going to assume I can com compute the net fluxes alpha k exactly. Here's the first theorem. 
if I have a polyhedral partition of state space and these assumptions hold, then I can have an error bound. If I approximate the true probability current by a piecewise constant probability current, then I can bound this in the L2 mu norm by a constant times this quantity, which is basically measures how fine my discretization is. The smaller all of my polytopes are, then this thing here will go to zero. And accordingly, the norm, the error, will also decrease. And the constant here, C here depends on the dimension D, the Lipschitz constant, of course, and the regularity of the polyhedral partition. So the interpretation of this theorem is basically in the continuum limit, as all of the partitions, uh, sorry, all of the polyhedra shrink to points, my piecewise constant vector field will converge to the true vector field of interest. And this is what you would expect because ultimately all I'm doing is a zeroth order Taylor expansion. So the next thing and the final step of the method is to use this piecewise constant approximation of the vector field to construct piecewise linear approximations of the streamlines, which are what, which are what we're really interested in ultimately. We fix an initial condition Z0 on the boundary of A and recall the definition of the streamline from before. Now all we do to approximate this is to just replace the true vector field with the approximate vector field. And as a corollary of the previous theorem, we get an error bound on the discrete streamlines as well. So here's an illustrative example. Um, I have my state space is just this rectangle, okay? And the boundary of A is this side, and the boundary of B is this side, and I'm interested in all trajectories that leave A and hit B before going back to A. The blue lines, as usual, indicate the boundaries of the polyhedral partition, and the gray vector field is the probability of a current that I'm interested in. So as you can see that it's rather weak in this area, and it's rather strong in this area, and it all points from A towards B. Okay? So the red vector fields is basically the piecewise constant vector fields that I've constructed using my method. For every polytope, I have one vector. That's just a representative. If I follow this discrete approximate streamline, uh, vector field, I'm sorry, I basically get a piecewise linear thing. And if I refine the polyhedral partition, my streamline will become closer and closer to the true streamline that I would get for the true vector field. So to conclude, the question that we started with was, given two metastable sets A and B, how can we analyze time series data of the reactive trajectories in a rigorous and principled manner? The relevance is, um, as I've come to learn from attending some of these talks, sometimes model runs are basically, ensembles of model runs are the best way to actually understand what's happening in your model, what's happening with your dynamical system. This method that I've presented to you is based on a framework known as transition path theory. I haven't mentioned to you that it's quite successful and is quite widely applied in areas of physics like molecular dynamics. Um, but we're not interested in that. We're, I would like to actually, if anyone has any feedback on how this method could be applied to climate geophysics stuff, please let me know. The second feature is that we've got rigorous error bounds under strong assumptions, admittedly, but we've got some bounds and we're working on weakening these assumptions. The third and important, most important feature, in my opinion, is that our method requires only time series data and a discretization. Many methods that work on analyzing data from SDEs typically assume or require that you have some knowledge of the coefficients, like the drift or the volatility, and here we completely bypass that. This comes at a cost. Of course, if we had more information, we could get better predictions, but in this, for this method, we're not making those assumptions at all. So what? Well, TPT exists for reduced models of diffusion processes, by which I mean Markov chains or Markov jump processes that are somehow supposed to mimic the behavior of the diffusion process. However, in the literature, to the best of my knowledge, there are no convergence proofs in the sense of continuum limits that I presented to you earlier. And in particular, the Markov property is not always easy to check or to justify. It's typically based on some kind of heuristic justification of choosing your observation time window large enough such that your system forgets where it was before. Our method provides foundations, or like basically the first foundations, as far as we know, of TPT for jump processes where we can actually prove convergence in a continuum limit, and we don't assume Markovianity at all. Ongoing and future work is based, where yeah, we want to really weaken the assumptions on the hypothesis to make this method actually applicable to problems of interest, um, and to extend the analysis of the reduced model that we've, con uh, we've constructed here. It would also be interesting to apply more efficient data generation techniques for sampling these ensembles of reactive trajectories, like important sampling. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and the organizers for this program and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. 
um, and, fellowship, and uh, funding from the University of Potsdam. Finally, thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much for the nice talk, Han. Uh, any questions from the audience? There we go. Uh, how, um, how do you choose your polyhedron um, uh, discretization? I've been seeing that it's not uh, uniform in, uh, I mean, dimensions. In each polyhedron is different from each other. solve a bunch of linear programs, but in terms of, um, in ter as a discretization, it doesn't suffer from the curse of dimensionality if you add a same mesh to it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry. Any other question? <coughs> For me? All right. Um, so if uh, we don't have other questions, then in the interest of keeping time, I suggest that uh, we move on to the next speaker. And thank you very much again. Thank you.